Welcome to another edition of Gaming Memories and in this video I'm going to be focusing on my childhood computer, the BBC Micro. Now there's plenty of YouTube videos out there already with the full history of this machine so I'm not going to go into too much detail but it was released in 1981 as a collaboration between Acorn Computers who manufactured the machine and the BBC Computer Literacy Project which aimed to educate people more about computers as the computer age was dawning. So as a result of that, this machine was adopted by about 80% of British schools at the time and is very much seen as an educational machine first and foremost. Hi, the average school child hasn't really changed much over the years. But school has. The computer has arrived. Under a government scheme, schools all over Britain are introducing microcomputers and they're choosing one in particular made by Acorn. As a result, the language it uses, called BBC Basic, has become the acknowledged computer language for schools. And now parents can catch up. So moving on to my history with the machine, we got our BBC Micro in 1982, so we're quite early adopters. And I've actually managed to get some photos of our system and I was using it back in the day. There's some pictures here of my friends and family. I'd say thanks to my mum for digging these out of our photo archives. And I asked my dad why he chose the BBC Micro and he did say it was because of that link to the BBC and the educational aspects of it. And also because of the user-friendly basics so he could learn programming and also we could learn programming. And I did spend quite a lot of time programming on the B when I was a kid. Initially our system did come with the tape player but we upgraded to disk drives fairly soon after that I think probably within the first year and that allowed us to access lots of pirated games. My uncle had a BBC Micro as well and we were regularly swapping discs full of games with him so I'm not sure we had hardly any original games for the system to be honest. Now obviously my interest in the system at the time was very much geared to games but it was a real family computer because my parents used it for office work, for word processing and accounting and things like that and we also had some educational software on there that me and my little sister used as well so it did become a real true family computer as it was designed to be back in the day. Now compared to the other home computers of the time, the BBC Micro was quite an expensive proposition costing over £300 for the Model B which is what most people ended up getting and also this reputation it had of being a more serious machine for office use and educational purposes meant that it was certainly not the most popular computer at the time. I think it probably came in fourth place behind the Commodore 64 Spectrum and Amstrad computers when the end of the 80s came around and you looked at the sales. Also it wasn't as well supported by some of the big software publishers at the time. The games publishers like Ocean, Hewson and Gremlin really didn't support the BBC Micro that much. As a result, the games library for the system kind of grew in a sort of splendid isolation with programmers that focused just on the BBC Micro and software houses like Superior Software, Icon and of course Acornsoft. They all produced games almost exclusively for the BBC Micro and its sister computer, the Acorn Electron. And as a result, there are many exclusives or original games on the system that never even made it off those systems. Uh, and those that did were actually quite highly regarded and that's where this video comes in really because I'm going to be taking a look at 10 games that originated on the BBC Micro they're not necessarily the greatest games for the system they're the games I really enjoyed when I was a kid I think some of them really are great games some of them perhaps less so in retrospect but I still think they've got something original to offer that other games for other systems didn't have and as I said many of them are exclusive to the system before I start this countdown, I should probably mention that some of the footage you'll see in this video, you'll probably hear the sound of keys being pressed. All good BBC Micro games should have been played with the keyboard. The joysticks for the Beeb were terrible, so I make no apologies about the sound of keyboard noise in this video because it's giving you a true BBC Micro experience. So without further ado, let's get started on my list of 10 great games that originated on the BBC Micro. One game that you're all probably expecting to see on this list is Elite. David Brabant and Ian Bell's legendary space exploration game began life on the BBC Micro in 1984 but I'm not giving it any more than honourable mention because most gamers already know about it and to be honest I've never really played it as when I was a kid I only had a pirate copy and I had no instructions so I didn't really know how to play it. So with that out of the way let's get on with the countdown. Kicking off this list in 10th place is Transistor's Revenge, a 1983 release by Softspot. This arcade shooter was an early offering from Chris Butler who went on to create several arcade conversions on the Commodore 64 including Ghosts and Goblins and Commando and later developed for the Amiga and Playstation. You play the role of a microchip that is under attack from electrical components such as resistors and capacitors and you have to defend yourself by sending electrical pulses down the circuit board tracks that the enemies approach on. If any enemy reaches the chip it's destroyed and their life is lost. 
The game plays rather like a 2D version of Atari's Tempest, with enemies approaching from all sides and you furiously sending charges down the circuit tracks to dispose of them. Additional points can be gained from blasting the various bonus items that appear, but you also have to be wary of pulses being fired back at you down the tracks. If it all gets too much, there's a smart bomb which zaps everything on screen. The presentation is very arcade-like and includes the ability to continue play after losing all your lives. While it lacks depth, Transistor's Revenge is a fairly unique concept, well programmed and presented, and a perfect game if you just want a quick and challenging blast. Next up in 9th place we have Hunky Dory, released by Bug Bite in 1986. You play the role of Dave the Dung Droid, who must escape the prisons of the planet Hunky Dory by negotiating 20 stages, collecting all the valves on each screen and exiting through the door at the bottom. Along with natural hazards such as spikes, enemies patrol the levels although they can be killed by using your shield. This uses up energy however, which also steadily depletes naturally. This action platformer was developed by Peter Scott and features his trademark chunky 4 colour mode 5 graphics with some cute sprites, especially the main character. Gameplay clearly follows the Manic Miner template of collecting all the objects and reaching the exit to complete the stage, but this is far more enjoyable thanks to the more precise jumping, the ability to fall any distance without dying and the fact you can eliminate enemies, though there is some risk to this as it depletes your energy. The levels are fiendishly designed and do take some planning or trial and error to negotiate, but the tight controls and engaging graphics mean it's worth sticking with. Peter Scott was one of the Beeb's most prolific coders, developing a number of highly rated original games including Thunderstruck and Ransack, before moving on to superior software and porting a number of big name titles from other systems, including Barbarian, The Last Ninja and even Sim City. He gave up game development after the 8-bit era and went on to work in TV production. At number 8 we have Daredevil Dennis, released by Visions Software in 1984. In this game you take on the role of Dennis who has just been employed as a stuntman and has to complete a number of stunt pack stages to earn his wages. Each level involves jumping over or avoiding certain obstacles on either a motorbike, a powerboat or skis. You only get three takes to get it right, otherwise you get fired. On later stages a helicopter will fly overhead dropping gold bars for you to collect for bonus points but adds an additional obstacle as you must also avoid hitting the copter when jumping. The game is effectively a platformer but there are only three controls, accelerate, jump and stop so you have to time everything right as you only get one chance to clear each obstacle. Graphically it's very basic and the gameplay is very simple but there's something undeniably compelling about the game which falls into the easy to grasp hard to master category as the levels progress. The game was developed by Simon Pick, who later moved on to developing on the Commodore 64, converting arcade classics such as Gradius and Shinobi, and coding a number of games for Firebird software, which I've reviewed on my channel. He later worked on Die Hard Trilogy in the PS1 era before joining EA to work on big franchises such as Harry Potter and Burnout. In 7th place is Acornsoft's Labyrinth, released in 1984. In this maze adventure game you must guide your character Mork through the labyrinth, eating fruit to replenish his dwindling energy supply and defeating the many enemies that occupy the maze. Each level is made up of a number of interconnected rooms with the player only able to see one room at a time and within each level there are two special rooms. The gate room contains the doorway to the next level which is blocked by a deadly force field and the key room contains a magical crystal which will remove the force field when collected. The player can choose to avoid the various monsters they encounter or try to kill them by shooting at them or squashing them with an indestructible boulder that you're able to push around as you travel around the maze. This is more risky than shooting and therefore scores more points. The boulder also becomes essential for negotiating certain obstacles as the game progresses. When I was a kid I was a big fan of the 1985 arcade game Gauntlet which never got a port to the Beeb and I saw Labyrinth as the closest equivalent at the time, though in reality it bears more resemblance to Berserk. In essence it's an adventure game but the presence of enemies that must be destroyed and the need to constantly top up your health give it a very arcade feel. It has a pretty unique game mechanic as you have to push the boulder around the labyrinth with you in case you need it to get through doors or destroy enemies that can't be killed by shooting them. 
technically it's quite impressive as the whole game fits into a single load and the enemies have some AI as they can move around even when you're not in the same room as them. Graphics are simplistic but bright and colourful and the sounds are basic but they fit the arcade game vibe perfectly. So while it may not be the most aesthetically pleasing game, it's both challenging and addictive and should appeal to anyone that enjoys a mixture of exploration and action. In 6th place we have the classic Thrust, a 1986 release from Superior Software. Probably the most well known export from the BBC Micro after Elite, the aim of Thrust is to pilot a spacecraft which must pick up a pod from the surface of a planet using a tractor beam and fly it into space. Each planet has turrets which fire at the ship and a reactor which powers the defence system. If the reactor is shot several times the turrets will briefly cease firing. Hitting the reactor too many times though causes it to go critical and destroy the planet in 10 seconds. The ship must then escape into space before this happens, with or without the pod, though obviously more points are gained if the pod has been claimed. Fuel is needed to manoeuvre the ship and can be collected with the tractor beam, while shield is also available. The simple premise of this game is matched by equally simple vector style graphics and minimal audio, leaving just the finely honed gameplay and increasing challenge of successive levels to keep you engrossed. As much a simulation of physics and inertia as a game, Thrust kept you coming back for another try because the control of your ship was so precise that you never felt cheated when crashing into the wall of a cavern because you knew it was entirely your fault for not mastering those controls. This challenging and well programmed game is appreciated worldwide and was ported to all the other 8-bit computers of the time and has even had homebrew versions released on the Atari 2600 and Vectrex in the early 21st century. Although the game was developed on the Beeb, the Commodore 64 port was actually released first by Firebird Software and I've reviewed that as part of my Silverbird series. The game was developed by Jeremy Smith who went on to co-create another highly regarded BBC Micro game, Exile, but sadly died in an accident several years after that game was published. Coming in at 5th place we have Boffin, released by Addictive Games in 1984. In this puzzle platformer you play a brainy professor that is trapped in a network of caves. To escape you must negotiate the platforms, collect all of the horseshoes and then touch a large owl to complete the level. Now, having said that I'm starting to wonder exactly what drugs programmer Paul O'Malley may have been on when he came up with this idea. Anyway, to assist you in your task you're armed with an umbrella. Not that useful you may think, but it can be deployed to help you safely fall long distances, hang off platforms and collect items that would otherwise be out of reach. Making use of one of the Beeb's high resolution graphics modes, Boffin has a psychedelic cyan and magenta colour scheme, but shows off some great looking and detailed sprites, the highlight of which is the massive spider that puts in a terrifying appearance on later levels. This is a proper shit your pants moment the first time you play this game, as it crawls across the screen towards you. The levels themselves are fiendishly designed and usually require pinpoint accuracy and jumping and use of the umbrella. As well as the spider, later stages feature trampolines and other hazards which must be negotiated in unique ways. Boffin is a tough game and there's a pretty punishing learning curve even on early levels, but once you get to grips with the control scheme and plan your progress before attempting each stage it really is one of the finest platform games of its type. It was an exclusive to the BBC Micro and Acorn Electron and features two versions of the game on one tape, each with its own set of levels but one of which is only playable on the Beeb. In fourth place we have Repton, or more generally the Repton series, published by Superior Software between 1984 and 1988. Undoubtedly one of the most well known games on the BBC Micro is Tim Tyler's Repton and its many sequels. The object and style of the game is very similar to Boulder Dash, dig through the earth, collect the diamonds and avoid the falling rocks. Tyler's acknowledged that he'd seen Boulder Dash in a magazine before creating the game but never played it, so while they are similar Repton shouldn't really be considered an outright clone. While Boulder Dash does have a certain charm, Repton has a lot more style with larger, more colourful sprites and the added distraction of eggs that hatch into big green monsters. 
Other challenges include safes that need a key to unlock the diamonds within, while the map screen that allows you to view the entire playing field to work out your strategy for collecting all the diamonds is very useful. With vibrant graphics, catchy music and some fiendish puzzles to solve, Repton had the perfect mix and quickly became a huge success for both Superior Software and the then 16 year old Tyler. Tim Tyler went on to create Repton 2, which was a completely different matter, with the distinct levels of the original being replaced by one giant sprawling level where you had to collect every diamond, puzzle piece and piece of earth to complete the game, with only three lives to do it. The game included new aspects such as transporters that moved you to different parts of the level, but with virtually no margin for error and no way to save your progress, it was just too arduous a task for most gamers. For Repton 3, Matthew Atkinson took over development duties after Tim Tyler declined to work on a third game. This was a welcome return to form, taking the more compact level by level approach of the original and adding features from the second game such as the lethal spirits that patrolled the edge of the maze, along with new additions such as the irritating fungus which expanded into any empty spaces it could find. Most significantly, the game came with its own construction kit that allowed you not only to create new levels, but also modify most of the sprites, a great attraction to any budding game designer. This was used by Superior themselves who milked the franchise with a series of themed add-on packs such as Repton Through Time, Life of Repton and Around the World in 40 screens. The customizability of the third game was a big hit with fans and the final release Repton Infinity improved on this further by allowing the users to create their own mini programming routines to dictate the behaviour of the game. Sadly, the final game was significantly slower than its predecessors and was probably hampered by that flexibility. Repton was arguably the flagship character on the BBC Micro, just as Superior Software was the flagship games company, and while some of the games were ported to platforms such as the Spectrum and Commodore 64, there's no doubt that Repton was and always will be a Beeb original. We're now moving into our top three and in third place is Citadel, released in 1985. This is another classic from Superior Software, a flick screen arcade adventure game designed by Denmark's Michael Jakobsen, spanning over a hundred screens filled with items to collect, puzzles to solve and enemies to avoid. The aim of the game is to prevent aliens invading Earth via a teleporter in the Citadel. You have to collect five crystals and place them in a starport, allowing you to teleport to the alien planet and destroy the teleporter, thus stopping the invasion. If this wasn't tricky enough, you also have to find three crowns and place them in specific locations in order to become ruler of the Citadel. This game perfectly mixed arcade style platforming with more cerebral problem solving, and some of the puzzles were truly inspired. For example, the guard of one room has to be fed a roast chicken to allow you to pass, but you only have a frozen chicken. The solution was to take the chicken to a fireplace in another room to cook it, and then deliver it to the guard. That's one of the easier ones, by the way. The biggest challenge of the game is effectively using the two item inventory. Inevitably, you'll find yourself trekking backwards and forwards through some dangerous areas and losing energy, so careful planning and mapping is almost essential, though thankfully there is a reasonable distribution of energy bottles to keep you going. The graphics are excellent for the time, using clever dithering effects to make it look like the Beeb had more than its eight colours. There's a huge variety of different locations and enemies, most notably the ghoulish monks that inhabit some rooms that can be dispatched with a well-placed projectile launched from your player's mouth, only to reappear when you re-enter the room. Citadel's an extremely polished game containing many hours of head-scratching gameplay, but the more you play, the more progress you'll make and the enjoyment you get from exploring and solving puzzles makes this another Beeb exclusive that's well worth checking out. In second place is Codename Droid Strikers Run Part 2, released by Superior Software in 1987. The exploits of John Striker were the subject of two games from Superior. The original Strikers Run was a side-scrolling run-and-gun game that could best be described as a cross between Commando and Green Beret. 
The mission was to progress from left to right, eliminating everything in your path with bullets or grenades. At various points along the journey you would find aircraft that you could take control of to further your progress. The graphics and animation for the game were excellent, but in retrospect it suffers from rather jerky scrolling and a slow pace. No such criticism can be levelled at the sequel though. Codename Droid combines run and gun exploits with platform based exploration on several distinct levels rather than one extensive one, making it an early, simplistic example of the Metroidvania genre. As you infiltrate the enemy base you must make use of objects you collect including pass cards to access lifts and energy modules to replenish your health and blaster power. Jetpacks can also be used at certain points which have their own fuel and blaster levels and allow access to otherwise unreachable areas. The use of a 4 colour graphics mode meant it was less vibrant than the first game but otherwise Codename Droid looked and played like a dream and was a great example of just how far BBC Micro games had progressed compared to earlier efforts, making it another high quality exclusive for the system. Codename Droid was co-developed by Martin Edmondson, one of many developers that started out on the humble Beeb and went on to be a major player in the games industry. Edmondson went on to develop classic games like Shadow of the Beast for the Amiga and oversee the highly acclaimed Destruction Derby and Driver franchises on the PS1 and beyond. Last but by no means least in first place is Imogen, a 1986 release from Micropower. Imogen is a wizard that, according to the backstory, lost his mind as a result of transforming himself into a dragon to save his village from another dragon. He's trapped in a series of caves within a mountain and in order to escape he must use magic and puzzle solving abilities. Each cave contains a number of puzzles with the eventual aim to collect a crystal that is then used to transport you to the next cave. In wizard form, Imogen can move, jump small distances and use any collected items. However, he can also transform into a monkey to climb ropes and a cat to jump larger distances. There are 16 caves to escape and you are limited to 150 transformations across the whole game, so you must use your three forms wisely to solve the puzzles and complete each level. Looking at the high res monochrome graphics, you'd be forgiven for thinking Michael St Aubin's game began life on the Spectrum, but it wasn't exclusive to the BBC Micro. Despite the lack of colour, the graphics are some of the most beautiful to ever grace the BBC with cute cartoon style versions of animals like rabbits, monkeys and frogs. The visuals are matched by superb animation, an excellent control mechanism and some brilliant puzzles, with a password system and random starting level adding to the longevity of the game. Imogen is a wonderful game that epitomises the creativity and ingenuity of 8-bit games developers and BBC Micro programmers in particular. It's not just the best Beeb original in my view, but one of the greatest of all games for the system, and would have been a standout title for any of the computers in the 8-bit era. That rounds up another Gaming Memories video then, I hope you've enjoyed my run through 10 of the best BBC Micro Originals. If you've not played some of these games before then please give them a try and I'm sure you'll agree that the B was definitely not just a computer for school. Let me know what you think about my choices in the video comments and I'd also love to hear what your favourite original games for the system were. If this is your first time watching one of my videos then please check out my other content and consider subscribing for weekly retro gaming goodness. Thanks for watching and see you again soon.